Now, just to talk about once we get into working with some of these products, and we, we uh, uh, were working actually in our Adobe suites, but on a PC in the building earlier on our, our uh, uh, exercises that we went through. But I want to talk to you just a little bit about a couple of things. Um, I'm going to do a, a quick little diagram. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, these tricks being choke spreads, gutters, and traps. If I want to print a red circle, PMS 186, on a black garment, I might typically, I might print that red, flash it, print again, flash it, print it again, flash it, print it again. However, if I'm running, say, a 185 that's a little bit transparent, I could stack that thing up with six flashes and still not ever get it completely opaque, and I'd still be able to see the, the, uh, the fabric through it. So rather than running a bunch of reds, I might choose to run a white underneath there, flash it, and then print my red on top. And the reason I'm using a circle, I can bring this all the way down and have it relate to a halftone as well. So whether I'm running a 55 line halftone or I'm running a big circle, this works the same. So I print my white by ultimately duplicating my red image in film positive form or direct to screen as the case may be. I would burn that maybe on a say a 110 print it, flash it, and then I would put my red, say, on a 156, print it, and then run it down the dryer. Now what happens a couple of times, or many times, is I print my red, followed by my white, and I start to see this little white line show up on the outside of that red dot. And then I get my micros out, or a hammer as the case may be, and I move my red over, or my white over, to try to line that up, and ultimately I end up with my little white line showing over here. So the solution to that is rather than duping or using my same piece of film, I make my white printer ever so smaller. So I really come in here and put maybe a quarter stroke of clear or white on my film or on my, on my black channel, on my black layer that is my white printer. I put that white line around the outside so it makes it ever so smaller. It gives that plenty of room to move around, whether it's top to bottom, side to side, so that we don't get this movement from, from uh, uh, what's called radial deflection when our, when our uh, presses might move a little bit or we have some tension issues, whatever the case may be. It's a bit of a band-aid, but it works really well to, to kind of avoid those, those parts. Now the opposite of a choke would be a spread. Rather than choking the white printer, I might spread the red. But I don't usually want to do that because if I have another color touching my red, I don't usually mess with those top plates. So we don't do much spreading, we do more choking. We make that white printer a little bit smaller. Now the trick is to make that smaller just by a hair so I don't visually see this overlap. I don't want to see a big dark brown line around my circle. So usually we start with a quarter point. We may back that off to an eighth point depending on how it works. Now from that point we go to what's called a gutter. Let's say I want to run that same circle, but now I want to run it red on this side and yellow on this side. So I'd print my white that's choked just a little bit, right? I'd flash it, and then I want to print white on white, my red and my yellow, because that'll keep my inks thinner and that's going to keep uh, my production up. I'm going to get the best. Uh, production numbers, but also keep a nice thin layer of ink, and the smoother and the, and the softer the hand, the better. The more flashing I do, the more my ink builds up, and I end up with a, a lot more stiff uh, hand plastisol that I'm not really looking for. What can happen, though, is when I print my white, I flash it, and then I print my yellow and my red wet on wet, we'll start to get a little smear in here, right? And that may be from a little movement, maybe from tension issues, all kinds of things that may cause that. But what we can do is go ahead and put that same negative space that we talked about out here, we put it in between those colors on the red. So our white printer actually looks like this, has negative space right down the center of it. So when I burn that on my screen and I print it, if I look at it from the side, I'm printing my white here and it has a gap on it. Here's my shirt. Oops. There's my white printer. It has a small gap. Then I print my red, and I print my yellow, and they actually fall into a gutter. That's why we call it a gutter. And have you noticed that you can print red and yellow next to each other on a white shirt, never any problem with them bleeding together? 
This is actually a gutter that we do, we're kind of emulating that same thing, but we're putting it on a dark shirt or a black shirt. And this gutter can save a heck of a lot of time in cleanup and, and wiping screens because ultimately that puts that space in there for those inks to go. Um, you want to keep that also as small as possible so that it still remains, but you can't visually see it as well. Then the, the final thing we'll talk about is a trap. A trap is used more in the transfer business. We try not to use a trap in our business. A trap is kind of an ultimate art band-aid. We like to print what we say wet on wet but registered type of printing. By that we mean this typically really applies to outlines. If I were uh, in the offset business or perhaps doing a, a transfer, say I want a, a red L on Lawn the Magazine. Red Lawn. If I were to print that red and in the transfer and, and offset industry, I would print the red and then I would dry it. UV, uh, conventional, whatever it might be. I would dry it and come back in, and if I wanted all of this black around it, I might actually come over the top here with my black ink. And the reason we would do that is for that same shift potential, so that we wouldn't have any gaps in case something moves around. What happens in our industry doing things wet on wet is we end up with a real shiny spot overlapping these areas. So ultimately we have this kind of this texture thing going on that gives us um, if not done very well, you can tell when people are trapping. If you have to trap, it's because you really got a bad press that needs to be worked on. Your tensions are all over the place, you need to address that. There's a whole bunch of other things to do that give you better results than traps. So that's kind of the definition of a trap. We don't like to use kind of an ultimate band-aid, uh, gutters, chokes, and spreads.